Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to CSIS and today's event, which is uh, on corporate social enterprise, a business-driven approach to development. Uh, this event is part of the Chevron Forum on Development. This is an ongoing series we have here at CSIS that focuses on the private sector's role in global development. Uh, I'm Jennifer Cook. I direct the Africa program here, and I'll say just a few brief words of introduction before turning over to my colleague, Dan Rundy, uh, who is co-director of the CSIS project on U U.S. leadership and development, and William Schreier, chair in global analysis here at CSIS. We're going to be looking today at the Niger Delta Partnership Initiative, uh, which Chevron launched in 2010 in, the, in Nigeria's oil-producing Niger Delta to try to tackle some of the region's long-standing challenges. Uh, the operating environment in the Niger Delta, uh, I, I think, as you all know, is an ex extremely difficult and complex, and the region really offers a textbook case of the resource curse. Uh, the Delta's oil production accounts for some 90 percent of Nigeria's federal government revenue, but communities of the Delta have been mired in poverty, unemployment, underinvestment in, in critical infrastructures, uh, and with state and local governments that have been unwilling or unable uh, to provide basic services uh, and security to their citizens. The political economy of oil in the Delta has entrenched powerful vested interests and stymied public investment in economic activity outside of the oil sector. And as the resulting sense of grievance and injustice has contributed to insecurity and violence uh, that has morphed in many ways with, with uh, sophisticated criminal networks with a major uh, oil theft industry uh, and an insurgency that's at a fragile point right now. There's an amnesty that's due to expire. You have upcoming elections in Nigeria in 2015, which have never gone very well in the Delta and which promise to be uh, fairly contentious. In the midst of this, Chevron has launched this new initiative. And I imagine that somewhere in Nigeria, there is some vast underground bunker uh, that houses the many development plans, the master plans, the commitments, the commission reports, analyses, white papers that have laid out strategies uh, to bring development and security to the Niger Delta. Uh, but with the failure of the successive government efforts and these top-down approaches, uh, companies have had to step in to fill the gap. Uh, and in the past, corporate social responsibility in the Delta has largely been understood as kind of a cost of doing business, um, mitigating reputational risks, giving social license to operate, uh, and maintaining good relations with the communities in your immediate geographical vicinity. So building a school or a clinic, um, funding non-governmental groups to do development projects, funding local community um, organizations to do traditional programs. These have been important, but they haven't had really the transformational effect that gets us the systemic problems uh, that make the Niger Delta such a difficult operating environment. So Chevron has been really at the forefront of, of thinking about how to tackle this in a longer term, more systemic way, um, as, as if an, a number of com companies, but I think Chevron has really been at the cutting edge of this. The notion of corporate social enterprise, I think as we'll hear today, really shifts away from this mentality of philanthropic efforts uh, that are seen as a cost of doing business to something of a business opportunity approach. Um, a, a corporate investment model that, that gets at the nexus of social objectives and business objectives. This changes really the, the incentive structure, which is what I think makes this so very different from all those many models of the past. As you'll hear, and I'll, I'll wrap up, as you'll hear, there's been a lot of thinking that has gone into this, a lot of deliberation, and most important, I think, a, a lot of on-the-ground analysis, uh, assessment, um, that, um, that I think Dennis has led on the ground to, to get this right, rather than to, to, to plunge willy-nilly into yet another de development strategy. And I think that kind of analysis, A, it can inform other efforts in the Niger Delta, but I think it also gives us a very good baseline against which to measure some of the impacts, the ultimate impact um, of this kinds of initiative. So I'm going to turn over to Dan Rundy. We, get, we have a distinguished panel, uh, which Dan will introduce. 
and I'm looking forward to the discussion um, as well. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks very much. The, the panel today is on, as we just heard, corporate social enterprise is a business-driven approach to development. Uh, we've got, um, we're going to hear from Dennis Fleming, who's the executive director of the Niger Delta Partnership Initiative Foundation, NDPI. We're also going to hear from Jane Nelson, who's a senior fellow and director of the CSR Initiative of the Harvard Kennedy School and also is an NDPI board member, as well as uh, my friend Christy Reagan, who's chief of party for USAID Grand Challenges for Development at DAI. Uh, I think, as, as Jennifer mentioned, as the traditional development landscape is changing and the role of the private sector in development is increasingly elevated, new approaches are emerging. And I think this corporate social enterprise model, which is designed to align with and advance business objectives, uh, is an emerged model or an emerging model that Chevron has been pioneering. So we're going to have a chance to talk about the NDPI model, but also more broadly, the conversation about corporate social enterprises and ways in which companies are expanding their roles in uh, solving broader development challenges. Um, I'm going to start with my friend Jane Nelson. Um, Jane, could you talk a little bit about some of the concepts behind corporate social enterprise and how they apply to existing corporate social investments? Thank you, Thank you Dan and Jennifer. And great to be here in your stunning, stunning new home, CSIS. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I wanted to start by highlighting five um, key concepts that I think both underpin the model that um, Chevron is implementing in the Niger Delta, but I think also underpin sort of emerging good practice in your corporate social investment um, more broadly. Um, and, and the first one is a very explicit commitment um, to both harnessing business disciplines, business skills, business processes, and business objectives together with sort of social development disciplines and skills and processes and objectives. And you know, we hear a lot about you know, sort of partnerships between different organizations that do one or the other, but this model is actually trying to sort of bring them both together in a single sort of organizational model, which is being very explicit about there needing to be business benefit and business outcomes, and also you know, what are the related sort of you know, social and development impacts and outcomes, and trying to be rigorous about not just you know, what those are, but the, the sort of the, the hybrid process of managing and implementing them. So, so the sort of hybrid, but a very explicit and intentional hybrid approach, which my you know, colleagues at FSG would call creating shared value, but being you're know, putting it into an organizational structure, not just talking about it, I think is, is the first um, um, thing to, to look at. The second key concept that um, I think has been very interesting in this particular project and has relevance for others is an independent governance structure. Um, the way that the, the program has been set up and the initiative has been set up is that there's actually sort of two foundations, one at the corporate global level, one at the, the national sort of operational level. And both of them are aligned, you know, it's Chevron-led, Chevron-supported, they're aligned to Chevron's compliance and governance processes. They've got senior Chevron executives on both of the boards, but they've got a majority of independent external board directors. And if you think about it, that's good corporate governance now on corporate boards of directors. And I think as we you know, think more strategically about corporate social in investment, you know, how does one get either independent advisory boards or independent governance structures um, you know, to increase the, you know, the rigor and the robustness of decision making, strategy, as well as oversight? So sort of you know, bringing independence into the governance structure is the second key concept I think has been interesting. And the having you know, a corporate structure and a local operational governance structure is unusual, and we might want to uh, dig that out a bit more. I think the third key concept um, that, that has been very important in this and, and in, 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 in uh, some similar initiatives is a very strong focus on building local capacity and both local institutional capacity of existing community institutions, government institutions, as well as local individual leaders, and not just going you know, for the traditional authorities, but you know, women and youth being you know, two very important focus groups and building leadership capability, um, as well as the institutional capability, um, and you know, through you know, support on you know, sort of training on you know, project management, organizational management, so strengthening the institutions, also using technology to give individual leaders and institutions more of a voice, more of an opportunity to connect with each other, 
and also connecting sort of economic institutions locally with conflict resolution and peace building institutions. And you know, it's a very, very complex, challenging area, but being, again, intentional about you know, success being local institutions and individuals gaining you know, both the capacity and the voice and the access that they need to be, to be effective. So that sort of local capacity building is, I think, a third key concept. The fourth key concept is what I call broadly sort of taking systems-based or trying to develop systems-based solutions. And two examples in the case of NDPI. You know, a lot of projects try and support you know, a thousand entrepreneurs and then they have training and they even sometimes get access to finance and then they don't have access to the market. So one of the things that NDPI has been doing and working with DAI is saying, okay, what are several value chains? And we've taken cassava and aquaculture and palm oil, which you know, can generate jobs in the Delta, can generate income, and let's try and understand the entire value chain and then work with local partners, you know, use technology to increase efficiency, productivity, and inclusion along an entire sort of value chain. So you're strengthening a market or a value chain, not just you know, supporting some individual entrepreneurs. And again, that's much harder, it's more difficult, it's slower, but I think you know, that systems approaches is needed. A second very quick example of a systems approach is not only doing sort of you know, projects immediately around the company, but using the experience of the projects and the data collected to have a broader regional discussion with government, and crucially with government, um, about okay, what does a regional development vision look like and how do we all work together to do that. So, so that's a sort of fourth concept, sort of systems-based solutions. And then the fifth and final concept, which, um, you know, Dennis personally, and I give you real recognition for this, Dennis, have, have, have tried to do is in you know, monitoring and evaluation is critical and we all recognize it's critical. I think a lot of focus on M&E is, you know, what are we measuring and what are the metrics, which is very important, but the actual process of monitoring and evaluation is as if not more important. And one of the things that you know, Dennis has been a champion of is more participatory evaluation models. And you know, that's well known in the development community. It's less so in the, the corporate community. You, know, you do it with your consumers and your, your customers as a company, because if you're not develop, delivering, they, they, they're no longer your customers. But actually in community engagement work, making sure that when you're doing evaluation, the community leaders and community organizations are actually involved in both you know, designing evaluation processes, but also being part of the evaluation process, so participatory evaluation. So sort of hybrid models, systems-based solutions, this focus on capacity building, your independent governance, and a much more participatory approach to evaluation are some of the concepts that I think are in this model, but I think have important relevance for all social investment models. Thank you, Jane, absolutely. De Dennis, can you talk a little bit about the corporate social enterprise model in relation to NDPI and its specific structure? Um, yeah, I, I think that um, a way that we've applied this, these concepts of a corporate social enterprise in, in NDPI, uh, you can find in, in a range of different ways that we, uh, um, uh, that we structured ourselves and structured our ability to work with, with other organizations. And uh, uh, Jane had mentioned the fact that we have two foundations that we've established, and that wasn't actually our original intention. We recognize the value of doing a, an initiative in, in this way where we're reaching out very um, aggressively to the donor community and to the private sector to work alongside us in trying to uh, um, achieve some social objectives that uh, um, it's best to do that at an arm's length from the company and from its core business activities. And so we recognize the value of having a foundation in doing that. And then it was mostly because of legal considerations that we recognized that uh, we had to have two foundations, one in the U.S. and, and one in Nigeria. And um, it created a, a lot of challenges for us in the sense that for every project and, and uh, decision that we do, we actually have to get approved by, by two boards. Um, and luckily we find a very strong kind of alignment between the two boards of, of the foundations and they complement each other. Uh, uh, we have one board in Nigeria which is very heavily focused on the operational issues and on managing the implementation on the ground, whereas the, the board for the foundation in the U.S. is much more focused on strategic issues and on, um, uh, on donor outreach and, and making sure that what we're doing kind of uh, uh, aligns with, with others' interests and, and uh, um, uh, activities that they already have planned for that region. So 
having these two foundations created a, a certainly a, a level of complexity in this whole model. Uh, but we found that the, the, this whole concept of having independent governance, for example, made a very big difference where we have four independent directors and three Chevron directors on each of the boards. And I've found that that's really made a difference in terms of how the company looks at the governance role, that the, the company directors that sit on the boards of these foundations uh, can, can kind of focus much more on uh, where is the business value, whereas the independent directors focus a lot more on the, the social value. And uh, that helps us to get the, the right balance of, of interest within this, this model. And so the company has learned through this process that um, having independent directors on the board is, is not so much about seeding control as it is about adding value. And that the, the company decision makers in, in a, um, a structure like this can, can really kind of let the uh, uh, development experts address the development challenges and issues within the decision making body, whereas the company people can make sure that it's aligned with the, uh, uh, the corporation's uh, uh, business value that it's trying to get out of it. Um, and this kind of uh, a layered or segmented approach to structuring the uh, um, uh, to structuring this whole initiative and this, this corporate social enterprise uh, has extended to the way that we even engage and, and contract our, our implementing partners in, in working in things where we recognize that uh, through our, our local foundation, which is, uh, uh, has a presence in, uh, in the Niger Delta in two economic development centers uh, that we operate from there, um, that we can use those, those centers and our programs in ways where we engage international partners to come in and bring in technical expertise, but not to take over the entire management of the projects and, and activities that we're doing on the ground. Instead, our foundation serves as somewhat of a hub or a catalyst for getting together international partners and a growing network of local partners to work together on the interventions that we're doing. And so we find this one is, is certainly a lot more cost effective in terms of how we're using our local partners, but even more importantly, it's building local capacity a lot more quickly. We depend very heavily on our local partners and we're constantly assessing for every activity that we do, how much do we need to depend on the international expertise of our international partners and how much can the local partners handle. And so it's, it's really kind of an, an adapted approach uh, looking at uh, um, uh, each individual activity, what is the local capacity and how can we, um, we improve that. And then what that gives us is really kind of, instead of one big partnership, it gives us a portfolio of partnerships to work within. And we don't ask donor partners, for example, to fund our foundation. The foundation is, is funded by Chevron uh, and Chevron funds go towards the projects that we're doing, but we, we work more with the, uh, uh, the donor partners and, uh, and others at the, at the project level. Uh, we identify where are their overlapping interests and our funding models for working together with donor partners take all shapes and sizes depending on the, the need that we're trying to address. So in some cases, uh, we give some of our funds to a donor partner to do the contracting and procurement and we provide support to it. In other cases, we fund projects in, in parallel uh, where we're us and a donor partner are funding the same organization to do different aspects of the same project. And in some cases, we actually fund complementary projects where we're working under a common strategy, but a donor partner is funding one program and we're funding another, and we link them up in, in various ways. So taking this, this kind of a, approach to looking at each individual need and how do we piece together the right partnerships to work on it has been a really important learning for us, and, and it helps us to constantly recognize that you know the structure, the model that we apply needs to, to arise from the, the goals that we're trying to achieve, the outputs that we're trying to generate for a, a specific project. And we feel this gives us somewhat of an entrepreneurial approach to setting this, this, this uh, initiative up where um, uh, we're constantly adapting to the context, to the need, we're adjusting our plans as we see new opportunities and we try to fill gaps where we see that they exist in, in uh, uh, ways that, that we can be a catalyst for more impact and more development. J Jane, you, you gave a very uh, full description of, of some of the principles behind the corporate social enterprise. Could you talk a little bit about, based on Dennis's description, what you see as 
specific to NDPI, what's new and different about it and or how it addresses some of the gaps that you've, you've seen in corporate social investment? Yeah, sure. um, yeah I, I think, um, thanks, Dan. I, th I think the things that are new and different, I mean, each of the components that I outlined and what Dennis has said you know, are being done elsewhere. And I think it's a sort of, you know, bringing together that um, is, is, you know, particularly uh, sort of relatively new, new uh, about the model. Um, you know, this idea of having this you know, dedicated organization structure, which doesn't have to be you know, separate, like it's been set up in this case, an independent entity from the company. A number of companies are setting up internal incubation units. Um, I think you know, Hewlett Packard might be in the audience that, um, for you know, creating sort of shared value models. So, but but you know, sort of having a dedicated unit that brings together these different skill sets and mindsets and, and the right incentives. I think is you know one thing that is um, that, that that is different, and the independent board oversight is is you know, certainly not common. I mean, to me, I think the most two most exciting aspects of the model are you know using um, you know, corporate foundation funding and social investment to catalyze making markets work more effectively for the poor and being more inclusive for the poor. And so you know business is market driven, and so often corporate philanthropy is totally unrelated to markets and making markets work. And so I think. You know, that, that, that focus on making markets work and then understanding the link between markets and, and, and you know, poverty and access to income and exclusion and conflict and peace building and you're know, trying to you know, build linkages between those two, um, you know, which is particularly unique sure. and challenging in this context, but you know, as, it, as is also in others. So that sort of market-driven approach and trying to make markets work better is one thing I think that's particularly interesting that not as many other foundations and corporate initi social initi initiatives are doing. And then I think the second thing that I'm most excited about is this sort of greater participatory evaluation model. And as I say, I think the development community has done participatory analysis and evaluation and monitoring for, for a while. But you know, for companies to be you know, much more strategic in, in engaging the, the communities that they work with um, and the community partners in both design of programs but also evaluating programs, I, I, you know, I, I think is, is exciting. I do want to make one caveat, um, just in case anyone should think in the audience that, that this is the only thing that Chevron is doing or should be doing you know, in, Niger, in Nigeria and in the Delta, and that you know, one of the challenges, and I think it is a challenge for the initiative, is how you align a program like this, which is about you know, harnessing social investment dollars to be most effective for development and the company with the company's you know, human rights programs and risk management and grievance mechanisms with communities and participatory agreements with communities, with you know, local content programs, building local suppliers, local skills, and indeed you know, with working with government, in the case of the oil and gas industry, on revenue management more generally. So you know, this is a particularly challenging industry sector and, and, and country, but you know, so this is one component. And you know, one of the, the, the key challenges is how you take your social investment, make it as strategic as possible and as participatory as possible, which I think we're doing here, and then how that links you know, to the other things the company is doing, you know, to ensure that its overall development contribution and footprint um, is positive at both the national, regional, and, and local level. Thank you very much. Uh, Christy, you've been working on partnerships for a long time, and DAA has a partnership relationship with Chevron uh, in, all around NDPI. Can you talk about the opportunities that uh, this corporate social enterprise model poses for development partnerships, and can you talk also about what are some of the incentives behind joining a partnership like NDPI, and as well as specifically from your perspective as an implementer, what's, what's your experience with, with these partnerships? Wow, that's three. Okay, um, let me take the first one. What are the big opportunities around this model for partnerships? Um, I see two huge ones and a number of other ones, but the big ones I see are it's an opportunity, I think, to break down the exclusivity and, dare I say, even some elitist qualities that have developed around a lot of the partnerships. What do I mean by that? Um, you know, a lot of partnerships, they're a big donor and they're a big company. And, you know, it could be Chevron or Walmart or Procter & Gamble, but it, it's, it's like that. And there's, there's not a lot of space for others to play, and we've all become, I think, including DAI and other implementers, far too passive in the whole partnership model. So I think, and I welcome this new model put out by Chevron, because I think it's an inclusive model for partnerships, and it goes way beyond. It, it includes local actors who 
whenever I've been asked, you know, why is it just like a big multinational? What about the little local actors? People would say, well, you know, it's so hard to get them. They don't have a lot of money. You gotta run around. It takes a lot of time. Um, this model has the local actors as critical, and I'll talk more about that later, about the sustainability. Um, I also think governments have been left out largely from a lot of the big partnership models, and this brings government in. And it makes a role for implementers also. Um, and we're not just their DAI as, as a contractor and as an implementer. I think one of the things that's been really hard to even convince and tell people about at DAI is that we are partnering with Chevron. Yes, yes, we are getting resources and we have a, you know, we implement and we get, we get money from them, but we're a partner and it's different. So I want to say that it's a huge opportunity to have a greater, more inclusive model of partnerships. The second thing I'd like to say about this opportunity is that it's, um, it takes partnerships as a model and it actually doesn't just have them at the beginning forming this, this entity that then does a project. It actually takes the partnership model and says, you know, we need to be doing partnerships all along and throughout the implementation of this undertaking. So that means that Chevron is forming a part, and it may bring in USAID, and it may bring in DFID, and it may bring other donors in, and then um, I'm just coming from a lunch where they're trying to engage a number of other private sector actors on a, at a large global le level, other organizations, trade associations, civil society, then you get down to the local level, and you're using the partnership model all the way along, along the value chain analysis and everything else. So you're integrating and actually demonstrating the value of the partnership model, not just to create something at the start and get some money, but to actually use it to solve the problem. And I think that's new and fresh, and I think that is really building um, a more robust model. Um, I think this model also, it, it really tries to get beyond this distrust of business interests and builds around the business interests. Um, it, in, it really looks at markets and enterprises and the value of, of business all the way throughout Chevron's business model as well as local businesses. It, it um, aligns the really the long-term corporate perspective with some carefully designed, long-term, very deliberate, slower paced program activities. We've not really seen that. We, are, we always hear, oh, this oil company is gonna be there for 75 years, but oftentimes their programs are like hyper accelerated, you know, like they're on ultra caffeine or something. But this program actually aligns that long-term perspective with a more deliberate, carefully thought out, well paced program implementation. Um, and I think another unique opportunity is around the knowledge sharing that this partnership is, is promoting. Um, this is just a case of it, but it happens in the field all the time, and they're bringing this model to other donors, to other actors, to other potential partners, to government, to implementers, and they're doing a lot of knowledge sharing. Um, Dan asked me three questions. I'm gonna to touch really quickly on the other ones. What are the incentives behind joining a partnership like NDPI? Um, sustainability. Another, I think, myth about partnerships is that we thought if we just got Walmart with 66,000 supply, suppliers in their supply chain that that makes a sustainable partnership. Uh, that's not it. Actually, it's the whole web that happens down here that brings sustainability. And so I think this inclusive integration of partnerships is bringing sustainability because it's all the way through. It's not just relying, because you actually don't get sustainability by having Microsoft or Walmart or Chevron or, or anybody aligned with, one, with a big donor or a couple of donors. We're getting scale and we're getting, um, we're getting scale that goes just beyond. I mean, the extractive industry is notorious for doing partnerships only, uh, I learned the term uh, today, along the fence line. They're really limited and we'll say, oh, that, you know, that mining company will only work in that tiny spot. 
Chevron with this approach has understood that it has to take, the circle has to be bigger. There has to be like a, a regional district approach. Otherwise you can't enable economic growth, which will eliminate poverty, which will help address insecurity. Um, it's systemic and it's, that's value chains approach are systemic. They're webs, they're not lines and it solves a problem. So I think those are the big incentives. Um, and then let me just briefly touch on what's the experience of DAI as an implementer on these partnerships. Um, DAI, as I said, I've, we've often been told, oh, you're not, the par you're not in this partnership, you're just the implementer. We don't sign the MOUs, we don't do anything, we're just an implementer. So the integration of us as a full partner this commitment that DAI is making to a long-term relationship with Chevron. This was not about money because we started out really small, <laughs> so small that it was embarrassing to talk about at DAI, who you know does those big multi-million dollar projects. But we, it has really allowed us to innovate. You can't always innovate on big donor programs. And so if there are implementers out there, for-profit or non-profit, um, I think that we need to get out of this contracting modality and think more about what it means to partner, how we need to innovate, how we can strengthen our, our strategic position. I would say that our work with Chevron has allowed us to win a very significant number of the DFIT markets for the poor projects, including we've just won the Nigeria project doing DFIT's M4P work. We didn't win Nigeria DFID work without doing our work on the ground with Chevron. So you, we have to get out of this strict, narrow accounting. Um, oh, this is a $50,000 contract. Oh my God, DA, I can't do that. We have to stop seeing it that way and we have to start seeing it as strategic positioning, innovation, um, and strategic partnerships that we want for the long term. Thanks, Christy. Uh, Dennis, can you talk a little bit of how NDPI is implemented on the ground and how it supports economic growth and long-term stability in the Niger Delta? I think this has been throughout the conversation so far, the balance of economic growth and, and, and managing, and dealing with this issue of, of conflict and managing, managing that. Um, yeah, the, uh, um, the interest in, in what we're trying to accomplish with this, this initiative is, uh, um, you know, looks really at, at kind of the, uh, um, uh, the, the interplay between economic development and conflict in the region. And so that had a, a big impact on the types of programs that we designed to, to do and the, the, the role that the foundation plays in, in uh, um, uh, being a catalyst for development in, in the region. And, um, one of the, the ways that, that we looked at it is, is we, we took a real kind of a systemic look at what are the enablers, the systemic enablers for economic growth in the region and uh, how does economic growth affect uh, or reduce conflict and how does conflict in turn reduce economic growth. And, and so we, we put a lot of effort into analysis and we reach out uh, uh, in a big way to a lot of different stakeholder partners in doing that analysis, figuring out what we wanted to do, but also how we could pair our resources with uh, uh, other donor resources to try and, and address those, uh, those challenges. And so our activities in the field really kind of center around our economic development centers. We have uh, one in uh, Wari in the western city of the, of the, or the city in the western side of the Niger Delta and one in Port Harcourt on the eastern side. And those centers don't just do economic development activities. They, they support all of our, our program areas, including peace building and capacity building and our analysis and advocacy programs. Um, and the idea is that those centers are really kind of a hub for a range of different uh, types of, of development activities. And so the partnership programs that we have with USAID, with DFID, with UNDP, uh, and, and other partners are run from those centers. And as we look at the value propositions for market actors in the various value chains that we work within, we also look at the value propositions for our donor partners and the development partners that we're working with to say that how can we 
fill some of the, the gaps in information that's available in facilities, training facilities, in terms of coordination and synergies that are going on b between different development actors. And we use those economic development centers as a place where all that happens. We have, if you go through any of those centers, you'll see staff from a number of different implementing partners. We have uh, regular visits from our, our, our donor partners. And a lot of sharing of information, a lot of sharing of training opportunities. Uh, we look at, at who has the best skill sets to offer in particular uh, types of uh, interventions that we're doing with the communities and also with the local partners, the facilities that they don't have available. And so that um, those centers and, and the, the kind of the, the catalytic and coordinating role that our foundation in uh, the Niger Delta is, is playing has really helped us to, to uh, not only leverage what Chevron is putting into this initiative in, in the form of additional funding and support for projects, but I think it's really, it's in the learning and in the influence where the, the, the real leverage is, is taking place where um, we're, we're constantly be looking at what have others learned, what, what have we learned, making sure that we have a good knowledge management system that shares that very aggressively with the different organizations that, that we work with. But on, on top of that, um, doing it in such a way where, where everything is really sustainable, that, that we're constantly analyzing what are the impacts, what are the, 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 the best practices that are being applied in such a way where um, we can see the, the, the impacts and we can scale them up whenever they're showing promise. And so we have a lot of systems and a, and a lot of approaches for doing that. And it's really that, that kind of value, not just a strategy, but a value that we have in embracing partnerships, which enables us to work with all these different organizations in ways that you don't typically see in that region where people are kind of usually off doing their own thing. And uh, by doing it through this kind of collaborative model uh, in all the program areas and the various project interventions that, that we're doing, we feel that uh, uh, we get a lot more impact and we get a lot more sustainability in the process. Let me ask each of you this issue of, we've talked about roles and responsibilities and sort of the evolution of which, it seems as if the traditional roles of governments and the multinational corporations as well as um, uh, Im implementers and uh, civil society is being challenged in terms of the challenges that are being presented, but also the roles that expectations of what different actors are supposed to be doing. Can you talk a little bit about how NDPI and, and the, con the context in the Niger Delta is challenging those traditional roles? If each of you could just, just speak to that, because I, 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 it sounds as if these are being challenged and there's a there's been a response in a variety of ways from the different sectors, and you've each touched on them, but it'd be interesting to hear from each of you about, about that. Um, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll start and take a stab, yeah, particularly on the government side. I'm not, I'm not sure the roles are being challenged, per se, by this, this model, and, and, and shouldn't be. I think there's a real danger, whether it's this model or any model, and you know, many of the people in the room are, are more expert, expert than I am on this one. You're either, um, you know, uh, you know, being the substitute for government in remote yeah, low and, that, and I think that's, you know, what the, that's where the challenge is. You know, and, and letting government off the hook. And yet equally, you know, even a large company like Chevron can't you know, completely influence the government, but they, but they can influence the government. So to me, one of the key, certainly goals, and we're a long, long, long way from getting there, but one of the goals is how, you know, how do you actually strengthen government institutions? How do you crowd in the government? And how do you crowd in government? And, and particularly, obviously, one of the Again, big challenges. We talk about government writ large. You know, the biggest issue is between, often between national and regional government. And you know, what, particularly in, in the natural resource sector, what revenues go back to regional government and local government? And then, you know, what capacity does regional and local government have? You know, even politics and corruption and things like that aside, you know, what's the capacity to, to manage revenues? And so, you know, working and to some of the, the policy dialogues that have been happening at the regional level, you're know, trying to um, create a, sh a shared vision. <laughs> And again, this has been tried in the Delta before, so it might not work, but it, it sort of seems there's a, because it's more data-driven as well, and a lot of research and analysis has been done by you know, uh, NDPI and others, you know, how, do one, how does one get a conversation going that's creating a shared vision with government, but also with donors and others, you know, trying to build the government capacity rather than replace government? And likewise, you're know, trying to build and strengthen the both existing um, capacity, but you know, also potential capacity of community-based 
organizations and you know, things like women's groups and youth groups, which are, which are so important and often don't get the, you know, the resources they need. So, so to me, a, you know, a, a key part of the, and, and certainly goal of the model, is sort of using this platform you know, to really strengthen and support both government institutions, particularly regional and local, and, and you know, community-based organizations, um, both in terms of capacity, but also giving the community-based organizations more of a voice in decision-making in these regional dialogues. Dennis, I'm sure you've seen this time and time again where the companies look to step in and take the place of government. And obviously, you, you explicitly have tried to avoid being sort of caught in that trap right, by the way you've designed NDPI. Can you talk a little bit about a little bit more about how you, you crowd government in and how you support capacity building? Because I do think this is, this is one of the critical challenges. Uh, yeah, I, I, capacity building is is really mainstreamed into into everything that we do, and and so we we look at at what are the local institutions that we really need to focus on in terms of capacity building, and uh, we work a lot with local civil society organizations and uh, business membership organizations like uh, farmers associations and market women's associations, but state and local government are a really key element in that, and so. We do look very carefully at uh, how we can involve the government and uh, um, engage them in all the work that, that we're doing. And we found quite a lot of traction, actually, in, in working with the, the state governments in the Niger Delta in particular in terms of sharing the data that we have and helping them to, to formulate some of their own plans and priorities around uh, what uh, uh, economic sectors are they going to focus on? What can they do to stimulate economic growth? And so I think that uh, um, where we've, we've, you know, different state governments have different dynamics and some of them are better than others. And, and those that we find traction with, we take a kind of a very entrepreneurial approach and focus on where we feel the benefits are and the impacts are going to be the highest. And so that tends to lead us to the more reform-minded uh, uh, state governments and even individuals within those state governments to understand what government really needs to do to stimulate economic growth. And, and so we, we see that engagement, I think, as uh, uh, it, it really helps to, to get the government to think about the policy angles and the, and the legislation rather than a heavily subsidized government approach to economic growth, which is what a lot of the, the government entities really think about. Um, but I think also where NDPI is kind of challenging some of the roles uh, that people are used to is this role of being a catalyst or a convener of different organizations. That, uh, that role is, a lot of people tend to see as either a public sector role or maybe an international aid agency or a development contractor or NGO of some type to, to be that convener and that, that facilitator. They, they tend to see the private sector as uh, uh, there to, to invest and only to invest in a specific market development uh, uh, opportunity. Um, and that's where we've been really kind of challenging to say that uh, if no one else is playing that role, we will. Our foundation will step in and try to be that, that convener because we have that much stronger commitment to partnership and collaboration than most of the other organizations have. They all embrace those concepts, but they're not structured in such a way to, to give a mandate to people within their organization to make that a requirement, whereas with us, it's, it's kind of factored into the, the very DNA of the organization, this whole concept of partnering. Christy, I know you've seen this challenge as well in terms of the where a company steps in and a government steps back and, and how you deal with that, that challenge. And obviously, NDPI was designed to sort of crowd government in. Talk a little bit about these, um, how, how, they're, how we're, these, these roles are being challenged and talk a little bit about how NDPI is, 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 uh, is responding to that. Well, on the roles generally, um, I've just been taught a big lesson by my daughter in New York who's in performing arts. And you know, it was, uh, I have to be an actor, or I have to be a director, or I have to be a writer, but I can't be all those things, and oh my god, I have to choose. And she called me the other day and said, oh, I can be all those things because it's changed now. <laughs> I can actually write something, direct it myself, and star in it. So I thought, OK. The point of that anecdote is that I think roles are less distinct and they're less rigid and I don't, I, I think they're blurring. Um, and 
we still have a need for all those roles. And I don't want to diminish the role of government by any means. But I've learned a big lesson um, working on the Grand Challenges where I thought, you know, ugh, why am I trying to get non-traditional actors involved in health and education? Because only the government can provide that. And then suddenly I see that these Bollywood guys who put some subtitles in local languages have gotten a, you know, an 18% bump in literacy. Or the cell, the cell phone provider who um, is getting data out of classrooms or in, out of health clinics is having a huge impact on. And I realized that, so one, I think the roles are not as distinct. And I think we need to be more fungible and flexible in how we see, and we can't just say, that's only them, that's only them, that's only them. We need to blur those lines more. I also think that we have to allow for non-traditional actors in. Um, businesses can provide a social value. Isn't that amazing? But <laughs> yeah. um, they can. And um, I think the other thing about non-traditional roles and expanding that net is that we have to understand that as we get more actors in, that they do need to be mentored. They don't all have the capacity to perform in the various permutations of their roles. And I think that's one of the things that um, Chevron's approach has been doing really well, and that is taking a long-term approach to mentoring. I've been working a lot with accelerators lately, and I realized that one of their chief complaints is that the mentoring just comes in for a year, or two months, or one month. And mentoring has to be periodic, and it has to be over the long term, and it can strengthen the different actors' roles. And I think that is one of the real assets that Chevron has on this approach. It is a sustained mentoring, and it recognizes that these roles, these new actors, new non-traditional and traditional actors have to be strengthened in their roles through mentoring, through capacity building, and there's a long-term commitment to that. I'll stop. Great. Let's open it up for Q&A. I think there are a lot of thoughtful people in the room who've worked on partnerships for a long time, and um, I'd love to hear from a variety of folks uh, here. I'm gonna, let's call on this gentleman here, the gentleman back there, and then let's see. And then this job, these, these three folks first. We'll go for these, these, these three folks. Okay. Oh, great. Thanks. Chris Jocknick with Oxfam. Um, I think this is a really interesting model. And of course, we at Oxfam are always pushing for more holistic approaches and more collaborations. And so, uh, of course, I think that's all to the good. But it strikes me that um, if you're going to get to the root causes of poverty in a place like the Niger De Delta, it's tough to do that without thinking about the, the resource curse, because Nigeria really is the poster child for corruption and inequality and conflict, all rooted in a lack of transparency and accountability and basic governance. And um, Chevron has a unique role to play in that because it's been a part of that problem in other situations, and because Chevron has so much leverage and voice and influence to address those issues. And so um, my one question is, how do you juggle that, that critical role of addressing corruption and accountability and being a voice for change on that front with your, your other, you know, the, the other projects that you're doing there? So how do those two things fit? And Jane, I think, raised that but did it so diplomatically that it might have glossed right over. Um, the second point is, if you're not doing those things, if you're not addressing the underlying roots, how do you bring on groups that are concerned about those? Or how, how can you be a convener sort of a, a good faith convener when a group like Oxfam, for example, would have a really hard time collaborating in a context like that if we didn't think we were going to address some of those root causes. And so you're sort of crowding out some of the critical stakeholders if you're not going to address that. And so those sort of two parallel questions. This, this gentleman back here. Thanks. Yes. And then, sorry. Okay. Hi, my name is Dan Silverstein. I'm a consultant. Uh, you've talked about everybody who um, can benefit from what sounds like a really wonderful program. I'm wondering about what do your competitors think of this? Okay, and then this third gentleman over here. Hi, David Greeley with Aquidia Global Health. Um, I want to ask a question about sustainability, financial and otherwise. 
uh, but just relate very quickly the story of our organization, which, with the support of Pfizer, set up a similar $50 million program to set up the Infectious Disease Institute in Makere University in Uganda. Enormously successful, has all the components, Jane, that you mentioned, plus a policy and advocacy role. Um, $50, $60 million, other corporate partners got involved. Now, with an independent board, independent staff, is raising $20 million a year for its operations. Pfizer's not putting any money in. That's the good news. The bad news is it's still very donor dependent. It's still receiving all of its money from PEPFAR and the usual grants. Um, the government is putting a million dollars of that $20 million a year, the government of Uganda. So my question really is with regards to uh, this project, it's great, $50 million from Chevron, another $50 million leveraged with other donors. But how can there be financial sustainability? And can financial sustainability come about if, unless the government itself uh, plays a role, including in the finances of that? Okay, I think it seems like most of those are directed towards you, but I suspect the other panelists will have points of view on, on and some of the, or all of those. Okay, um, I guess uh, uh, starting with the, uh, um, with the role of, of transparency and, and corruption and, and uh, uh, these issues which uh, uh, I think we all know plague the, the Niger Delta and are a significant uh, um, obstacle to overcome in, in making any, any real progress. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's an area that we don't ignore, but at the same time we uh, uh, look very carefully at what role that we can play as an organization, uh, particularly one which is funded by an oil company, to take a very neutral role on a lot of issues where we can help to facilitate dialogue and mediation on conflicts and, and issues in ways where we're not seen as taking sides on, on various debates. Now, we've been working with a, a number of different activist organizations, ones that openly criticize Chevron on a range of policies and, and issues, and we separate that from the work of the foundation. And we've had a number of organizations that, um, that we've been working with that at first said they wouldn't work with the foundation because it, they saw it as an arm of Chevron. They saw that it was uh, uh, that that it was kind of uh, sleeping with the enemy, so to speak. And and um, and once they found that that our activities, our programs, were really kind of divorced from the uh, the 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 company's role and, and business activities in, in the region, that we could work on on a range of different issues. That uh, um, that that you know, th that that was something that they could do, that they could accept working with us, and uh, it doesn't mean that that's an endorsement in, in some way on their part of what uh, uh, what Chevron is doing, and the, um, the dialogue with Chevron continues on a lot of those issues. So we don't try to replace that or take on that role. We, we are about development, and we found that we can work with a lot of activist organizations in helping them to link up with, with partners and get involved in, in dialogue with uh, uh, various uh, uh, development actors in the region that maybe they weren't uh, doing so before. Um, in terms of uh, uh, what do Chevron's competitors uh, uh, think of this, um, it's been a bit of a challenge to get uh, uh, different companies in the oil industry to collaborate on uh, 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 social initiatives, social investments of various ways. There have been some examples of that. Not all of them have been really good experiences for the, the companies. Um, like we've been indicating in a lot of the things that we've said so far, uh, a, a key, you know, element in this approach is just looking at what it is that you're trying to accomplish and figuring out the best means of doing that, not always following a traditional approach. We find that, uh, for example, if we want to um, uh, pair up with other oil companies to uh, do a, a local content initiative or, or something, uh, that we can use a lot of informal mechanisms and get a lot of influence, and we get a lot of uh, collaboration going at the practitioner level. And it's only when we go to get into very kind of uh, high-profile public partnerships with the companies that it gets a little bit more complicated in terms of addressing the competitive issues. And so it's just really how do you engage? You know, the, our foundation is, uh, uh, is open about its support from, from Chevron, 
uh, but we work regularly with other companies and give them data and guidance and input as to how to do their own economic development initiatives uh, so that they can learn from what we're doing. And if we see better development activities going on, everyone wins in that process without necessarily turning it into some sort of a formal partnership between a company like Chevron and a company like ExxonMobil or, or Shell or, or someone else. Um, in terms of the sustainability, um, it's, it's something that, that, that we kind of learned and that we thought about more is, is that, you know, I've never been a believer that, that, you know, sustainability strategy should be just getting others to pay, you know, what, what your initial donor is, is putting into it. It's, it's what is the sustainability of uh, the initiative from a point of view of um, what does it take to keep everything going? We started to notice that uh, uh, if you make a kind of a really clear distinction between NGOs, civil society organizations that are dependent on donor funding and uh, um, private sector consulting firms and development contractors that are working in the same kind of development space, none, the, the private sector ones are not necessarily any more sustainable than the nonprofit ones. And at the end of the day, it's a market system. It's a supply and demand issue. And so we look at our own foundation, for example, from how is it meeting demand? That demand may be from, from aid agencies and other donor partners that are going to be giving out grants or development contracts. It may also be uh, uh, banks and private sector investors that are interested in the agricultural value chains that we're trying to support. And that if we look holistically at the market for economic development services, then that helps us to, to keep the foundation relevant. It stays within its mission of what it's trying to accomplish, but it recognizes that there is a supply and demand equation that it constantly has to be uh, uh, addressing to make itself relevant in the long term, and that relevance will help it to survive through either donor funding or uh, uh, consulting revenues or training revenues or any other way of keeping this mission and this institution going. Jane, maybe you could speak to any or all those. Great, yeah. I think very, that's good picking up on, on um, you know, Chris's very important point. And, it's, and I apologize if I was too diplomatic about it, but you know, there's no doubt that you know, so NDPI is you know, a corporate social investment model, and, and I think a very, very innovative one. You know, there's no doubt that Chevron or any other major company in this industry sector has, you know, to me, you know, two enormous responsibilities in, in the area of you know, uh, managing the, the, the broad macro challenges. And one is just asset-based you know, risk management and due diligence. And you're being able to demonstrate, you know, as John, Professor John Ruggie would say, you know, know and show you know, both your, your potential negative impacts on, on human rights and the environment and safety, et cetera, and demonstrate you know, that you're doing due diligence and you've got systems in place to manage those risks. And, and being absolutely rigorous about that in the, 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 the sort of the operational-based integrity of what the what the company is doing, and and obviously the sort of respect for human rights has now become a central component of that. And I personally think we're going to see you know more of what we're starting to see. And Oxfam has you know written about this, um, you know, sort of independent panels assessing that as well. And your know, IFC funding now requires that type of process for project development. And I think um, you know, the sort of independent overview process that we're talking about here, we'll, we'll probably see in the asset-based risk management. But so, so there's that component which each company is primarily and its operating partners are responsible for. And then I think there is this incredibly difficult aspect of revenue management um, and responsible resource revenue management. And you know, to me, there's several components. There's the transparency piece. And again, 10 years ago, we weren't even thinking about transparency. We've come a long way with things like the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, but we all know there's still a way to go. And you know, to me, you know, what countries, companies do collectively at the national level around revenue transparency, you know, there's a lot of opportunity there. And you know, Nigeria's got some interesting models beginning to, to evolve there. But then it's not just the revenue transparency piece, even if you know, there's sort of more transparency and less cor corruption in the payment, it's then, you know, what are the revenue management models, you know, sovereign wealth funds, you know, how do you address some of the macroeconomic impacts of Dutch disease, et cetera. And again, you know, it's not an individual company's responsibility, but what is industry doing with donors, you know, to just, again, sometimes often just build basic government capacity <laughs> to set up sovereign wealth funds or, or other you know, mechanisms uh, to, to do the macro management of the revenues. And then thirdly, and in some cases most challenging of all, is then the benefit sharing. And you know, more and more 
countries, as we know, have a benefit sharing agreement between national government, regional government, local government, and sometimes between landowners and local communities like in Papua New Guinea. A, you know how much money actually gets to where it should get. Once it gets there, how is it managed? And that, I think, then you know, comes back for you know, companies at the, you know, at the operational level um, to try and build some of the, the, the local capacity. But, but so you know, it, 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 there's no doubt that you know, the entirety of both the, the company as well as companies working collectively, um, I, I think are recognizing the root causes now much more than it's done in the past. Um, but we've, we've, we've ways to go in those areas. Um, but you know, I think we're beginning to move in the in the right direction, and um, you know, it's sort of encouraged by the you know the NGO community being being critical as well. And I think it links to the question on competitors. You know, there that is an area. You know, safety is one area where you know there's every reason for competitors to work together. And I think this whole area of of, of revenue management and transparency, um, you know, is a, is another area. And obviously, very mixed mixed results so far. And um, uh, but. Um, where we are going to need more um, you know, progressive uh, collective action, particularly at the, at the country level. Christy. Yeah, just briefly, um, just on that, what do your competitors think of it? I think the real question is, um, because I think that competitors and businesses I've seen, if they see something that's working for another business and that's a good model, um, they're going to use it. They're going to try to see how to adapt it. I think the real challenge here on this model is to make it um, accessible and to um, frame the opportunities so that other companies, maybe they're not going to join this because some companies just aren't joiners, but who could employ the model. And I think that's a huge challenge that's facing everybody sitting at this table and out there to, to bring this model and make it accessible. Um, on, I just want to say something on sustainability, and I know that um, Dennis addressed address the institutional sustainability. Um, I just want to flag that, you know, the real outcome Chevron's seeking here is to um, improve the lives of 32 million people living in the Delta so that their security and their risk to their business is, is, is better managed. Um, but it deals with the lives of 32 million people that are pretty poor. And I, I think the very careful selection and the employment, and I, I feel that that's DAI's role and responsibility in working with Chevron on this is to bring a lot of years of experience on how do you address poverty through markets, through economic growth, not through writing checks and, and you know, handing communities cash. Um, and the whole selection of a value chain approach was very deliberate. And those studies were done very carefully, and they were done slowly, because we didn't just go in and do them, by the way. We actually trained the local capacity to do them um, and to continue to do them after a DAI would be out. And the value chains that were selected, palm oil, cassava, and aquaculture, catfish, um, they were selected for growth, they were selected for employment, and they were selected for income generation potential. And that, for anybody working in development, that's the heart of where sustainability lies. So just for 32 billion people living in the Delta, whatever happens to the foundations apart from that, um, if these markets work and there's income generation and jobs, there's sustainability there. Just looking at, um, see if I make sure I don't miss anybody on this side. Nope, okay. So, okay, on this, okay, Tony, thank you, sorry. It's, it's a Tony, I'll, I'll Tony, and then this woman back here, and then Andrew Mack, please. Sir. Dennis, um, I think if I was 30 years ago to pick the perfect job, person of combination of Indiana Jones and a Peace Corps volunteer, you've done it between uh, Papua New Guinea, Angola, and now the Niger Delta. Um, Tony Carroll, Manchester Trade, and a senior associate here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the political game. Uh, Nigeria has sifting political sands at all levels. Um, recently, a, a, a large governor in the Delta split from the ruling party. Um, you have um, lots of changes and lots of complexities at all levels. A, um, how do you manage that process? And B, how do you build constituencies for your project beyond the political spheres? Do you use public media? Do you, do you use engagement at all levels? Because it seems to me the best way to insulate yourself from political change or vulnerability to political change is to broaden your constituency of support. And this, this woman here. 
Hi, just to build a little bit on the last comment in terms of, and actually an earlier comment, in terms of the actual impact that we're looking for here. Can you talk a little bit about how you are measuring success and what the measures are, um, maybe the timeline of when you expect to see impact, and if you have any examples, anecdotal examples of impact to date? And if you pass it back to Andrew. Uh, thank you, Andrew Mack, AM Global. Um, I'm gonna actually, uh, I'm gonna make a comment as to something that Christy said and then p pick up on something that Tony said. First of all, uh, to Christy, to your point about the models and being able to port them to other, other companies and other, other markets. Uh, we worked for years on a Chevron road safety project and one of the markets that we worked in was, 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 was Uganda. When Chevron pulled out of Uganda, a real testament to how well that, mo that model worked was that they were no longer there and all of the other partners stayed with the same model. So it is, once people see it working, it, it really has its own stickiness, it has its own life, and that's a good thing. Um, to Tony's earlier point, you took my point about the politics, so I'm gonna ask about the, the other aspect of it, which is uh, physical security. A lot of what you all are talking about is taking a long view. And I think we'd all agree that that's extremely important, especially if we want to bring in non-traditional stakeholders, talking about building their capacity and, and actually creating the space for them to, to participate. But when you're talking about a really un unstable environment, physical unstable, you know, rebels and the like, and when you're talking about a lot of the major underwriters being interested parties, because you're interested in stability, you're not necessarily interested in change, how do you address that and how can you maintain yourself more or less, if not as an honest broker, at least as an honest partner in that context. Thanks. Okay, Dennis, again, a lot directed to you, but I'd love to hear from the other panelists on this as well, but please, Dennis, go ahead. Okay, um, well, I guess in, in terms of kind of uh, uh, handling the, uh, um, uh, the, the pace of, of political change and uh, um, the challenges that we have in, in working with a number of different government institutions where there is a lot of uh, uh, political dynamics that we need to be aware of and that can affect our, our, our programs. I mean, that's a, I think that's an ongoing challenge that virtually any implementing organization faces wherever they're, they're working. You, you have to strike that balance between working with the government and engaging them uh, to be a partner in the programs and to be supportive of what you're doing and at the same time not necessarily relying upon them so heavily in your program implementation in ways where if there is suddenly a, a, a change of a key uh, a public official or uh, a change in, in political priorities that your, your uh, project isn't, uh, um, uh, isn't stuck in the, in the middle of that, uh, that situation. And, you know, it's an ongoing challenge. Um, but one of the things that has made a difference for this, this model and for Chevron's approach and what we're trying to accomplish is the fact that we are taking a regional approach. And so, like even the example that you mentioned in, in some of the uh, uh, political divisions that have been occurring within the, uh, uh, the ruling party in Nigeria, um, uh, the fact is that, that we have structured our, our programs and our, our priorities in such a way where we can shift if there are challenges or problems that are holding back our ability to, to work with a government partner and, and get things done. And given the fact that there are nine states in the, in the Niger Delta region, uh, we have the, the opportunity and the, and the flexibility to kind of put the challenge to them to say that we will work with those states that are the most reform-minded, we will work with those, those states where we can get enough st stability and uh, alignment in policies and approaches uh, to be able to, to get something done. And so that regional approach makes it a lot easier for us to, to, to shift uh, gears to, to change priorities and, and even clusters that we work within uh, based on, on where we can get the most traction within the, uh, within the government. Um, in terms of, of measurement of, of success, um, we are, uh, are fortunate to have a lot of really useful guidance out there in terms of the Donor Community for Enterprise Development Group, which has a lot of guidelines on uh, uh, measuring economic impacts, uh, uh, designing results change, which helps us to uh, identify clearly what we're trying to achieve and the indicators that, that we're trying to measure. Building up the capacity to do that well takes a long time, and uh, we've invested a lot in it, we've made a lot of progress, we have a long ways to go. And uh, um, I think when it comes to measuring the socioeconomic impacts, 
the tools and the, and the techniques out there for doing that are a little bit better defined. What we're struggling a little bit more with is identifying the business value. How do you measure the business impacts for Chevron so that we truly get this uh, shared business and, and social value? And, and we're, we're putting effort into that, but we got a lot, a lot more work, work to do in, in that regard. Um, and then lastly, in terms of uh, uh, physical security and uh, um, uh, you know how we work in this really dynamic environment where we have a lot of these challenges and and these risks and of course these risks affect our ability to to do things we uh, operate in an area where others have have been reluctant to go and we've had to structure our our programs our support networks our uh, um, uh, even our physical facilities in the field in such a way where we can entice other partners to come in and do it we can satisfy them that we have a good strong uh, uh, ability to uh, uh, um, uh, to identify the, the, the security risks and not put our own practitioners and partners at, at risk, and, and that's an ongoing challenge. But one of the things that we found is, is that in addition to kind of the traditional security resources that a lot of the oil companies use in the area, which we, we draw upon as, as well, uh, we also draw upon the resources from our peace building program and the conflict early warning mechanisms that we've put in place with civil society organizations to help us identify where are the hot spots, where is conflict brewing in such a way where these security risks are going to pose a, a problem for our staff. And before the other panelists um, speak, I want to put Pauline Baker on the spot, who's the former president of uh, Fund for Peace, but also is an NDPI board member. If you could just, I'm going to ask Akari to come up. I'm sure you'll thank me for this later, Pauline. I'm sure, but 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 if I, just you just given the work that you've done on conflict, I, I thought it would be interesting just to hear from you. Given that you you sit on the board of NDPI, you'll have a particular perspective on this issue of the security issue in conflict. Yeah. Um, well, I think I'm glad actually you did raise that because I think again one of the unique features of this model is that it recognizes the link between economic development and conflict. Um, and that's very rare for a corporation to recognize that. A lot of people pay lip service to it, but they don't integrate it into their programs. So there is a peace building component to this. And it's doing something remarkable. It's actually building a network of peace agents. Over 300 individuals and organizations have signed up for it. There is a website. There is um, a tracking of incidents. People are reporting where incidents are breaking out. And conflict usually arises at the local level, a lot of times for peripheral reasons. It's not, it's not for anything that has to do with uh, you know, large national issues. It could be resource competition. It could be the dethronement of a local traditional leader. It could be all kinds of things. And that allows them then to track the drivers of conflict and then relate it to the network that they're also building on the economic sector. So it not only helps them in terms of protecting their staff, knowing where the hot spots are, uh, but it also gets again to the systemic drivers of conflict and identify what those are, how many of them are economic, how many are them not. There are a lot of them that this model will not address, but there'll be some that they will. But what will be left behind would be this network of peace agents, people who are getting in touch with each other, who are collaborating, who are discussing the drivers, and this is really important in the Niger Delta as the next two years arise because there's going to be a general election in two years and the amnesty for the militants are going to expire that same year. So there are two events that are coming up that are going to increase tensions in the Niger Delta and there will be a peace network that, that uh, PIND has created and, and working with the Fund for Peace that is ready to respond to this and have early warning. Um, and what we have found in those kinds of experiments is that the network usually comes up uh, on their own with interventions of how to stop it and stop it locally by the people themselves. It doesn't have to be a government intervention. So this is, again, another dimension of it that I think makes the model uh, extremely useful. I'd like to hear from uh, Jane or Christy. Oh, here, here. I totally second that that broad, well-integrated partnerships can offer a buffer um, from the political and a basis for peace and totally endorse that um, economic growth, market-focused fo activities also are, 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 are peace-strengthening. I, I did want to um, flag one thing about the success. Um, so here's one. Um, Chevron took 12 months to do the value chain studies. 
Um, okay, 12 months, <laughs> let me say it again. That's a success story in my view. Any major multinational corporation that will carve out 12 months to do well done value chain studies that before they even begin to do an activity is a success story. And I can tell you my colleague who works on this, who is anyone remembers Jim Grant who used to work at Ron UNICEF, it's his son and he's um, got his father's dogged vision and I know Dennis <laughs> suffers from, um, you know, my colleagues won't lay down and just roll over and say, okay, Chevron, you wanna do this in a month, well, okay. No, they're, they're really, um, you know, our role is to, is to work with and advise Chevron on best practice. And, and Chevron has, has taken that very much to heart and is very concerned about success. So I think that's a huge success. And anybody who knows companies knows that there are very few out there that will do that. So, Jane? I'll, I'll just, um, yeah, very quickly, I have just one other comment on the security perspective which again links back to this question of you know, how does NDPI link with the, you know, the, the, the rest of the company is the um, use of the voluntary principles on security and human rights. And um, you know, again, going back to your question about the competitors, that's one other area where there is you know, slowly and painstakingly increased cooperation um, in terms of local training and, and putting processes in place um, you know, to ensure that you're know, protecting the security of the company's own assets and partners and practitioners. Um, you know, one's not potentially undermining human rights and security of the community partners. And I don't know if you want to say anything on the voluntary principles or add to that, but I... Well, I, I think we, uh, um, uh, we, we definitely look at them as they apply in a, in a broader context, not just uh, uh, how they apply to Chevron or how they apply to the, to the foundation, but we've been exploring ways of how we can take the, those principles and apply them to even civil society organizations and, and others to think about the, the full impacts of what they're doing, the, the, the human rights aspects of other programs that they may be doing. And so that's, that's kind of opened up a new space for, for dialogue on those principles that, uh, that Chevron didn't have before. Okay, we've got time for one or two more comments or questions. If not, we can end it, end it here. Yes, just go for this. Last, last one. Uh, thanks, Dan. Bill Jorn with ROI3 will be developing apps for that part of the world. Um, you didn't indicate when you started and, and then when you were really fully operational, uh, so that, that would be helpful in the context of my question. That is, can you describe, have uh, any, or you've touched on it here just a few minutes ago though, but can you really describe quantitatively the, the impact that you've had in the creation of viable uh, economic development, business activity, job creation, and even companies that are providing services and so forth to Chevron? Um, well, firstly, we, uh, um, we, we started in 2010. Um, we recruited our first staff for the uh, uh, for the foundation in Nigeria in about August of, of 2010, and uh, um, we spent, as as Christy had mentioned, we we spent quite a lot of time on analysis at the beginning before we really started to get some some interventions underway on the ground. Um, We've, you know, f from the, the start of a new institution point of view, we've grown very rapidly um, uh, by most people's measure. We, we went from that, uh, that small beginning with a, a few people to uh, um, uh, operating from the, the Nigerian capital of Abuja to now three, three locations, uh, including our economic development centers and about 45 staff in the, in the field, um, uh, and, or sorry, in the head office and in the field. Um, but a lot of our interventions didn't really start getting going until late uh, 2011, uh, uh, around 2012, um, and we have a range of different projects that we're getting underway. Uh, there is a report, I think, that uh, uh, has been uh, made available that shows some of the uh, um, impacts that, uh, um, uh, that we've had. Uh, but because it is early stages, I mean, we, we do have numbers of jobs created and uh, uh, just under 500 jobs uh, um, as of, uh, of this year and uh, a range of different partnerships. But really most of our indicators that we've been able to measure so far are output 
uh, oriented, but particularly in terms of the number of people that we've been able to train and uh, businesses that we're working with. But you know, it, the measuring the, the longer term sustainable impacts is uh, uh, something we're still working on. And uh, with the types of market development approaches that, that we, we use, you don't generally start to see uh, um, those impacts in a significant way until, say, years three and four. Uh, and even then, it, it's a, um, it kind of starts with small clusters. And then once you've done your um, interventions in a way where they demonstrate that they, they are, in fact, achieving the impact, then you go for scaling up and, and replicating. And uh, you know all that takes a, takes a bit of time. Just, I, I would just make one comment, which is about that we, uh, Dennis was kind enough to come join us maybe about 18 months ago. And so this is, we see this as a progress report of something that's going to take you know several years to build on, and so I think we're we're, uh, we're we're hoping to have you back here in 18 months to give us a further progress report on this. So why don't you all join me in uh, thanking the panel? Thanks very much. Thank you.